and this is something that, that um, I have been thinking about before, is that without, like you said, you can talk to the authority party, the partisan authority, all you want. If, they don't, if they're not going to move, then the only thing you can do is try to have a credible, legitimate opposition here to give people other options, to show them what an alternative looks like to something that they have become accustomed to since the beginnings of this country, basically, since the Civil War, let's say, since after the Civil War. We don't have the capacity in this country, most of us, to even visualize what does an alternative look like. And our opposition, the protesters, um, different mm -hmm. protest groups, and even opposition in parliament, they do not, they're so fragmented and they don't have a platform that shows people what an alternative looks like. This is actually the perfect segue into why I reached out to you to begin with. And it, uh, I don't think it's a dated tweet. It's maybe from 10 days ago or two weeks ago, but it's, it's that sort of, it's that question that is never really asked properly. And I think you finally sort of just, you just addressed it. You're like, well, let's try a parallel regime. I don't think you actually meant a sort of uh, Lebanese government in exile. I don't think you meant it that way. Or may maybe, maybe you did, but I assumed it was more like, just at least present the alternative and whether or not it's appealing to the average Lebanese protester, government supporter, doesn't matter. Whether or not the citizenry is ready for something different. And, uh, you know, I liked the debate online because there were people rushing to defend you, then people sort of saying, what are you talking about? There's no such thing. And I'm curious, because that, that is really why I reached out to you, what you would consider at this point in history to be an appropriate alternative for the, I, I automatically say power sharing, but I'm trying to remove that from my lexicon. What a Lebanese state should look like and how it should operate if it is going to tackle these kinds of issues. Because at the end of the day, accountability, corruption, transparency, we're, we're talking about the state. We're talking about representatives in the state and we're talking about the state itself. But just in terms of Ma managing a normal country. What what does that look like to you, given Lebanon's history, given Lebanon's problems, and the problems that we are we're familiar with? They tend to be political. They tend to be also regional issues. Lebanon gets sucked into. But what is the alternative? Sure. I mean, we this conversation is gaining a lot of steam now because I think people have come to the realization that what we have now just doesn't work, mm -hmm. and we need to think of something else. When people talk about a new social contract, um, this is what they're referring to. I mean, I'm not in a position, I think, to tell you structurally what a new system in Lebanon looks like. I can't come up here and defend federalism, for example, which is something that a lot of people want, or to defend the sectarian power sharing, because I just, I just don't know enough about the pros and cons and the implications mm. of all of these different uh, organizational structures of society and, and of government. Now, I think one thing that is obvious is that you need to decentralize somehow um, because it, it doesn't make sense for me when, I, when I'm in Tripoli, where, where my family's from, to, that they have to go to Beirut to do anything. You know, you, everything is done from a very centralized system. Yeah. It's, 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 it's inefficient, it's inconvenient, and uh, it, it hurts accountability, I think. But my perspective is in how do you run government, no matter how you decide to organize government and organize society. I'm somebody who spent most of my life uh, in the U.S. So I have seen the benefits of having a liberal democracy, a pluralistic liberal democracy with, that is... Uh, uh, based on mer meritocracy, based on accountability, um, transparency, uh, independent branches of government, just all these like kind of um, typical things that, that people associate with what does good government look like. Yeah. So when I think about what does the alternative look like, I'm not really thinking of it from the perspective of what, what organizational structure does this country need to have because I, can't, I don't really know enough to say that. But what I visualize is even people in opposition, 
you're either the revolutionaries or or the independent MPs or whatever you want, they criticize a lot. They criticize this government, this politician, this minister, whatever. But you don't know what, okay, what would you have done? What, what does your, you know, if you were a minister, what would you have said? What would you have done? So what I, what I was thinking of is how do you bridge that gap from people being able to visualize what does a good politician look like? What does a good minister of finance and prime minister look like? What would he have done? For the, whoever ends up being part of this opposition, and you can have political differences and economic policy differences and whatever, but mm-hmm. we're so far away from arguing those things now <laughs> that there is a common ground now. There's yeah. a common ground to the next couple of years that you can get people together who belong, you know, let people on the left, people on the right, the center, whatever. What if there was, and, you know, this might just be ideological or idealistic rather thinking that it could never happen. But I see like, you know, a politician go up, whatever, the prime minister goes up and does a speech. And I could think, man, what a shitty speech that was. Uh, you know, and I, I, I imagine what would somebody <laughs> like... Uh, you know, because my perspective is is U.S. because that's where I was raised. What would uh, what would an Obama speech in this crisis have have sounded like? One that really rallied people uh, and got people excited and mobilized this country to face this crisis. You know, or anybody, not just Obama, so whoever, whatever you know, politician you 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 you, you feel gives you inspiration. Um, but what if there was that here? What if you know these opposition groups got together and formed a parallel government, a shadow government, not in the English sense, but just a, I am the, you know, minister of this, and he is the minister of that, and show people on this issue, this is what I would have said, this is a speech I would have done, this is how I would have solved it, and show what a functioning government looks like. Can I ask you just in a simplistic way, because I think the simplest question here kind of exposes just how crazy the situation is. In that shadow experience, and let's just say you're nominating names based on merit, not on anything else, do you find yourself automatically trying to adhere to the way Lebanon has governed itself? Meaning, are you trying to then find minority representation? Are you trying to, uh, you know, adhere to certain quotas? Or are you thinking way beyond that? You're just saying, this. none of that matters. I'm, I'll have 10 of one, t- of one flavor as long as they can get the job done. And that's my shadow experience. Ronnie, you don't need to. Mm. You really don't need to because by picking based on meritocracy, you're going to have a mix of people. I mean, look at look at the nerds, for example. It's small <laughs> yes, scale. That is it's true. It's true. You're right. right. The <laughs> nerds are are Maronites and Orthodox and Sunnis and Shias and Jews and 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 whatever you want. We came together organically. Yeah. That is how it would work if you do it by meritocracy. You're not going to have ten Sunnis because there's talent everywhere. You don't. You don't need to end up that way. So, so it's a natural, it's a natural conclusion of merit meritocracy, and the, at least a potential shadow experience in Lebanon that you wouldn't have to worry about those old issues because they don't matter. At least when it comes to this, pulling in professionals, it just doesn't. It doesn't matter. You can. You don't need to adhere to quotas because it lines up naturally by default. Because that's that's yeah, a very. Exactly. Okay, so that's I a mean, very listen, if, yeah. Sorry. If you okay. have, if you find that you have, I mean, in the shadow cabinet or whatever you want to call it, I don't think it'll be an issue. Of course, in a, in a society, in a government, you may find that some groups do end up being underrepresented for structural reasons because they come from poorer areas, they have less opportunities, they've been neglected. Yeah. And you okay, you end up having to, I mean, the same way you do it racially in some places, you would do it, whatever. You might have to do that here. But I mean, that's just a conversation for, I think, another time. But to but say that... In a way, yeah. Sorry, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no to I've interrupted you, you too many times. Have, <laughs> no, 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 please interrupt. Yeah. To say that you need, you know, this uh, position in the central bank or this position in the ministry needs to be this religion and that religion. You don't need to do that because if you're doing it right, you're doing you're doing it based on meritocracy. You're not really, you're just going to have a mix. Sometimes this sect will be overrepresented. Next year, the other one will be overrepresented. It just doesn't, it just, it shouldn't matter if you're working properly. 
So let me ask you then, and I, I, we've, I, mean, I know we've kind of gone away from finance, but I think that's okay because you said it even in the webinar, and I, I fully subscribe to this view, that Lebanon's problems are not economic, related; they're, they're political. So politics is, at the end of the day, the, the big issue that we're all dealing with. Economics is a pain that we feel more immediately, but politics is the problem. Lebanon somehow, the inertia, at the end of the day, is to govern this way. And for better or worse, this is how things tend to maybe not work but this is business as usual that despite yeah. all efforts and it's been 30 years since the civil war ended the average lebanese citizen today may want a different may, may want a better state but still cannot get there so i mean is it psychological is it is it is it that the the power sharing is so old and so strong that we don't appreciate how sturdy it is you have to Think about how different groups in this country, what they're, how they experience their interaction with their, this country. Everything here is existential. The Druze see their position and their interaction with the society as existential. Christians mm. do the same. Shia do the same. Because there's no sense of security for anybody. And if you give up this sectarian power sharing, the consequence of it to somebody who does not feel secure in their own country, secure under this under their system of government, is that they will want the sectarian power sharing because it's existential. Yeah. The consequences of it failing is is their their elimination from this country. Yeah. yeah. That's what you need to solve because if people felt secure, then they wouldn't care that somebody from a different sect is president. They feel secure in their country, whatever he be, doesn't matter. And there is an incentive for the existing power, you know, establish, the establishment to not offer up that security because they are beneficiaries of right. that feeling of insecurity people have. This is, what, this is what I don't understand about people who um, focus in the way that they do about um, the, the weapons of Hezbollah, for example. Is that mm. how you talk about that? Because I think that's an important it's topic. One of, the, one of those rare episodes where I deliberately didn't bring it up, and then no, it no, comes no. up on its own. So, <laughs> hold that, please. Because, because it's an important topic. Yeah. And because of my background in a place where you have a free, liberal, pluralistic society where everybody feels secure and everybody's on equal ground, I... I'm, I'm obviously a supporter of having a one army with that has weapons, no militias, and it's not just Hezbollah that's armed, everybody's armed. I don't think, I, I don't want that in the country because that makes me feel insecure. But in order for me to end up in a place where there are no armed uh, a resistance group or, or militias or whatever they are, you need to address the reason why this exists and you don't address it by just saying we need to disarm this or disarm that guy and take by force their weapons away from them because first you can't do it by force you can only do it by convincing people that they don't need these weapons to feel secure in their own country if you want to have if you want to disarm people you need to recognize the reason why they feel they need to be armed you need to recognize the fact that People in the South were neglected by their government for most of the history of this country and were faced with um, attacks that their government did not protect them from. And that's why they feel like they need an, an armed group to defend them because their government won't do it. So rather than saying we need to disarm everybody by force, let's address the issue and make people feel secure in their country. And because you do it from the bottom up, you do it voluntarily, and it's the only way to do it, because otherwise you're gonna have, you know, one of the reasons that you could potentially have another war in this country, because people see everything in existential terms here. So how do you get them not to see their existence here being threatened? Let's go with that. A healthy dialogue on the insecurity of a certain population, geographically or confessional, just the insecurities and the the willingness to hold on to civil war era like 
arms. And it's actually more sophisticated in certain ways than the Lebanese army. What kind of conversation do you have in Lebanon that addresses those issues and then you have that population feeling more secure? Because that, what you're saying, I think, is the wall that we all face in Lebanon. And that I think also trickles down to other issues too. It's not just uh, weapons. That it, it sort of it impacts every other problem. What is the mechanism there? I, I, I simply don't see it. I, I don't you know, know what it looks like. And I, I wish it was there, but I don't know what it would even look like in the Lebanese context. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it's, it's not an, an easy answer to to conjure up because it's, I don't, you know, I wish after the Civil War we had done more cultural exchanges, you could say, you know, because I know people that I grew up with in Tripoli who, you know, had never met a Druze person in their life. And then the first time they go up, okay, I took my friends up to, to visit my, my friend from college. Uh, and, and they uh, never went back to Tripoli. <laughs> But they loved it. They, they would course. call me every weekend. Can we go up and, and visit Jad again? It's like it's a different you know, planet. So, so <laughs> exactly. So, so that automatically removes some of the barrier because they know that, no, I mean, these are guys just like us. They like to do the same things we do. Um, yeah. How do you do that on a national scale so that people see each other as human beings just like them who have the same problems, same issues, and are not a threat to them? Now, how do you do that in the context where you have a political establishment that is incentivized not to make that happen? I don't know. Um, I, I don't know how that happens. Yeah. Um, you know, one way that you make people feel insecure is, okay, you remove Riyad Salemi, and then you remove that guy, and you remove that guy. And if you're only removing Christians, then people feel like, okay, what the hell? Why is it yeah. only us being removed? Uh, it's true. Um, so that in itself causes insecurity, even though you might say, oh, this guy does actually need to be removed. But you know what? No, screw you. Remove your guy first. I, I don't know what the solution to it is. You know, maybe it's the new generation that doesn't have these kinds of thoughts because they've gone to a, a school that is multi-confessional, gone to university, worked in Beirut, um, doesn't really have these this uh, legacy of the Civil War. Um, maybe it's, you know what, maybe unfortunately all the only solution is that it's just going to take time people get exposed to media on youtube and tv and travel maybe and and that's the only way that you're going to end up getting through this and you have organizations that will organize this kind of thing and encourage it um i mean what did countries do that had these kinds of conflicts you know what did uh, what did rwanda do what did uh, former yugoslavia do um oh, you know i'll actually that, i'm going to I, I, I don't like to interject my own thoughts when I'm asking somebody. I feel like I'm interfering a bit, but I'm going to get on this. And maybe we can wrap it up around this issue. Balkans, every paramilitary group was disarmed against the population's aspirations, against its desires. Every single Bosnian Serb paramilitary in Bosnia was disarmed. At times it took NATO intervention, and it, at times it was done in different ways. And then you have these figures showing up in, in the uh, ICC in The Hague. You have Karadzic and Mladic and these sort of figures, and Milosevic dies in jail. And, uh, and this is a very, it's a very, uh, it's a heavy sort of involvement in de-escalating and disarming sub-state groups. That's the Balkan experience. Uh, Northern Ireland, I mean, the IRA disarmed. And only today do people talk about Belfast and sort of like this, uh, yeah, it's a very hip, up-and-coming part of Northern Ireland. And it's funny, you think of Belfast. I'm old enough to know Belfast in a very different way. People think of Belfast as sort of the next exciting sort of destination. Um, every other experience in, in sort of transition from conflict to post-conflict or whatever, conflict resolution, disarmament of sub-state groups happens. In Lebanon, it happened. In the early 1990s, there was only one group left that had weapons. It was smaller back then. It was nowhere near as, in, as sort of a, uh, an existential issue as it is right now, uh, but it was there. The other, other weapons that exist in Lebanon were Syrian and Israeli weapons on Lebanese soil, but those departed. 
as well. So it's really Lebanon's post-Civil War era, I think, and maybe I can get your thoughts on this. We can only talk about post-Civil War history once all groups are treated the same way. And there isn't one that's given special status. Even if it requires heavy exchange with a community that feels that their that their well being is at stake the moment those weapons depart, but that's just that's part of the story that that, that has to be done somehow. Regardless, the weapons are still there, and uh, I don't know. I see that always as kind of every other issue in Lebanon is problematic. Holding the state to account, I think, is impossible, so long as the civil war state sort of uh, limps on. And maybe I can just ask you if if that if that resonates with you, or do you see it? As, as sort of separate, that no, no, Lebanon is unique, in a sense, uh, and Lebanon can handle Hezbollah while sort of moving forward in, in other areas. Um, I mean, it may be that Hezbollah is a major roadblock to what needs to be done in this country, because, you know, for various reasons, um, you know, there are sanctions on this country, um, yeah. there's this desire to face East and, and de-dollarize the economy. And so, so what do you do? You know, um, I, I think if Hezbollah didn't exist, we would still be in this mess. I don't think they're the cause mm. of it. Mm. And I think it would still be very difficult to solve it. But mm. I think the existence of, of Hezbollah and the way our international interactions have, have gone and the way that you have groups that are more powerful than the state. Yeah, obviously, I mean, who's... It's it's un nobody can deny that this is a an issue to doing. I mean, what if if everybody else wants to do something, and a group that's armed doesn't? It's not going to happen. You know, I think it's it's as really as simple as that. Right. What we need, and again, you know, I feel like spending too much time in the U.S. You become very uh, idealistic about what can be <laughs> achieved, because you you know you you read stories from history and even modern history of people, countries that mobilize together to solve, to face an, an incredible challenge. And they made very difficult decisions together. You know, is it possible that we have a national dialogue in this country where we figure out, you know, the, the, uh, how to solve the financial and economic crisis, where we figure out how to do reforms, where we figure out the issue of Hezbollah and its relationship to the state and its and our international relations in a way that this, everybody in this country can get behind. And it takes brave decisions to do that. Absolutely. If that is not possible, if it's not possible for us to do that, then we cannot solve any of our problems. And there's only two directions you go after that. Okay. You go into each community, you know, collapsing upon itself and mm -hmm. having different, you know, cantons in this country. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You go to civil war or you just go to chugging along with this current system where people get poorer, the economy gets weaker. We have more sanctions. We have more, um, you know, what we're seeing now, but just progressively getting worse and worse and worse and worse until people can't take it anymore. And then what happens after that, I really don't know. Um, you know, it's a time, I think, I usually don't like to depend on, you know, the, whatever it's called, there's the theory of international relations, like the, the, it's a theory that's about the role of the individual, the individual decision maker uh -huh. in, in determining um, the, the, the future of a country. But I think, unfortunately, we're in a place where really that's where you are. There's no institutions here. All you have is strong men. And if they're not willing and able to do it, then we just need to wait because a war will happen or eventually they will be replaced by people who are willing to do it. And it's just unfortunate that that's kind of, I think, where we find ourselves. I don't know. If, I'm curious to hear your, your perspective on that, actually. I'll say something, and I'm pretty sure you'll agree on this, that... I saw the debate on the streets of Beirut from October until maybe January. And I was in Martyr's Square almost every day in Riyadh Salah. And I saw that exchange. And I thought it was finally a population having a, a conversation. And there was really no, no politician there. It was just the average Lebanese interested in learning. 
I mean, sort of funny moments where the egg became a sort of like a town hall. Uh, yeah, Martyr remember. Square itself, and yeah, yeah, you had tents. I was even. there too. You were there, right? And the, I mean, yeah. while it's raining, people are talking about the need for transportation and, and public transportation. It's like, almost like a, it's a parallel conversation in a sense. It's almost <laughs> like th these are the basics and this is what we need. So I, I saw that, and I don't think in any of those conversations, anyone even cared where the person was coming from. It was like a complete non-issue. The names didn't matter. Uh, there was no sort of, you know, this is going to offend certain people or certain communities. It began happening maybe in January that sort of uh, the conversation was stifled. I mean, COVID-19, I think the, 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 it had already dwindled so much before COVID-19. But anyway, coronavirus just sort of swept it away. Now it's back, and it's not the debate, it's not the dialogue, it's more the, uh, we're, hu we're hungry, we're about to starve, we're desperate, and we're going to break things, and we're going to set fires, and we're going to, we're going to, you know, really sort of intimidate. And that to me is not, that is maybe in that, maybe that is the only expression left, maybe, but it's not the debate that one, that you need to have if you're going to have political change down the road. But in, in any... In any case, I guess what I'm saying is I've seen both. I've seen the positive, which did not reach political power, at least not yet. I also, I think, we're both seeing the negative now, which is maybe it's just too difficult to do this right now and uh, I have to resort to more immediate, painful ways of expressing before we get to a better place.